the Soviet parade grounds of the 1930s, Russia proudly displays its medium tank. Russia's neighbour, Finland, would come to see these tanks in a much different light. In 1931, engineers for the prototype design and mechanical section, the OKMO, of the Bolshevik plant in Leningrad, was given a project to design a free turret medium tank, and by December the prototype was ready for testing. The engineers came up with a tank of riveted construction with a turret on two levels. On the top level was a three-man turret with a 45mm gun, and on the second level was two machine gun turrets with the driver in between them. During tests, the suspension was found to be unreliable and so was the engine. However, in October 1932, the prototype was handed over to the Kranksny Putolets plant, later renamed Kirov plant. The plant built 12 vehicles by the 1st of May, then 10 were sent to Moscow and two stayed in Leningrad to participate in the May Day parades. From 1933 to 1940, 503 examples were built in several different production versions. The first 14 production tanks are distinguishable by their small stowage boxes on the fenders and the lack of radios and antennas. After this, production was fairly standard. These production vehicles were vastly different to the prototype. The basic layout of the tank had stayed the same, however the tank was now largely welded. The main turret was enlarged and was now elliptical. A KT-28 7.6.2mm gun was now installed. There was also engine and transmission changes, as well as the small turrets were changed. The defining features were the early exhausts and the air intake cover with no intakes. The production vehicles after this had radio antennas in the turret. The stowage boxes were now enlarged, and the stowage on the fenders was now more extensive originally consisting of two jacks, two shovels and two spare wheels, but later a hull suspension arm, smaller jacks and tarpauling. Also these production tanks had the early exhaust with one pipe on top and the air intake cover of the fan with no intake vents. The T28s are not very well organised into subtypes, so you can go by the year of initial production. So these vehicles can be named by their years. So this can be known as a T28 model 1933, although most vehicles were built in 1934. However, now I will call these early vehicles model 1933s. From 1934, the first major change was implemented. This was an access hatch into the air intake fan that was perforated to allow air into the cooling system. The original design was a door that opened in one piece upwards. In addition, the new style exhaust was introduced onto the tank. These vehicles are known as T28 model 1934s, however vehicles with steel rimmed road wheels on the 4th and 5th bogies were produced in 1936 and are subsequently known as T28s model 1936. In addition to this, in 1936 new turret hatches with P40 anti-aircraft mounts were added. These also come under the 1936 banner. In 1937 a new air intake catch was produced. This hatch consisted of two doors that opened vertically. These vehicles are known as T-28s, model 1937. Again in 1937, the air intake doors were modified to open horizontally. This group of T-28s are referenced by their gun, the KT-28 gun, which was quite adequate for infantry support, but was not effective as other types of weapons in the anti-tank rule. Therefore, in 1938, a new gun was integrated into the design. This was the L10 7.6.2mm gun. These tanks are called T28 Model 1938 or sometimes T28 L10. The last production change was the addition of a conical turret. This was only produced on a few tanks. And there were only a few photos of this vehicle. These tanks are called T28 Conical. The T-28 was a huge source of pride for the Red Army, 
As no other country had a medium tank that was as sophisticated as the T-28 in the early to mid-1930s, the tank was boasted many features including power turret steering, a rotating turret floor, and sophisticated electronic systems which allowed the commander to control all the turrets using lights in the main turret. Not only technological prowess, the T-28 was a great propaganda weapon and was often seen in films, on parade grounds, or crushing trees and fording rivers. However, was the T-28 up to the legendary status the Red Army bestowed upon it? The first conflict with the T-28 took part in the annexation of the Baltic states, where the tank performed well according to Red Army reports. However, the fact the T-28 had no enemy tanks to engage, this report is not reliable. Again, in the Soviet invasion of Poland, the tanks are reported to have performed well, but again, the main Polish tank force was either destroyed by the Germans, or were deployed in the West. The first real show of the T-28 was against the Finns during the Winter War. This is where the T-28 flaws first started to come to the forefront. The Soviet 20th Heavy Tank Brigade was equipped with T-28s during the conflict, and to say they did not impress would be correct. The tank's firepower was very good for Soviet tanks, however with armour only 30mm thick, even the 37mm Bofors gun could knock out one of these monsters. It was the poor combat record in Finland that caused the Kirov works to rework existing T-28s to EH standard. The basic idea was to bring the T-28 into the new age of armour protection. 50mm plates were welded onto the hulls and turrets, returning to the factories for repairs. The thing is, this greatly reduced manoeuvrability of the tank. However, it did mean that the armour was now impervious to shots by a 37mm gun. As these pictures show, tanks with KT-28 guns and L-10 guns were up-armoured. However, a lot of tanks were also up gunned to L-10 standard. These photos show a very rare example of T-28. If we look at the suspension armour, you can see that it has four hinges on each side of the tank. This is an indication that it was produced in 1934. In addition, it has a single hatch air intake and a single hatch in the turret, pointing this tank to being a 1934 production tank that has been upgunned as well as being upgraded to EH standard. So was this new upgrade in armour able to keep the T-28 modern? I would argue yes, it was already a match for any tank on the battlefield in 1941. When we look at the Panzer III and T-28, both medium tanks, the T-28 comes up better in a vast array of areas, including firepower, crew comfort and armour when we consider the EH. However, the T-28 was less manoeuvrable than the Panzer III. As for combat during World War II, I will now read a combat report of a T-28 in June 1941. The 16th Mechanized Corps received an order from the Company General in the southwestern front to attack German forces in the direction of Kazan towards Zitomir, Ukraine. Participating in this attack were tanks from the 29th Regiment of the 15th Tank Division, which were still retained T-28s in the order of battle. During the counterattack on the village of Semenvoka near Britchiev, a platoon of T-28s under the command of Ju Junior Lieutenant Vasily Sumtov knocked out three German tanks, two anti-aircraft guns, a mortar, seven trucks, and killed nearly 100 infantry. I will now read a second combat report, also from June. When German forces were occupying Minsk, a single tank unexpectedly returned to the city. A T-28 commanded by Gen Junior Sergeant D.I. Malko he rolled down the street at full speed, ramming prime move movers and trucks as he went. Due to the surprise nature of the engagement, he had entered Minsk from the west. The tank was able to travel the entire length of the city unhindered and was only knocked out when it arrived at the eastern edge of the town. Malko was wounded, but the whole crew was able to bail out during the tank. After the war, Malko was awarded the Order of the Patriotic War First Class for his actions that day. So, in 1941, was the T-28 able to hold its own against the Germans? The fair answer is no. Not because of the tanks, however. The Soviet tank force was decimated in June 1941, but not due to the quality of the machines. 
more to the savage purges that had so badly affected the Red Army. More T-28s were lost due to breakdown or lack of fuel than enemy combat. In addition, the Luftwaffe's air superiority took a major toll on the Red Army, whose troops were already demoralised from the savage 1930s. However, the T-28 tank was in service with the Red Army right up until 1944. That's where the last two were still on the Leningrad front. However, Russia was not the only country to deploy the T-28. Finland had captured several types of T-28 in the Winter War and in World War II, and operated a small fleet up until 1954. This is where most modern examples of the T-28 are today. There are three T-28 EHs at the Palora Tank Museum in Finland, and one KT-28 T-28 at the Moscow Great Patriotic War Museum. We cannot talk about the T-28 without mentioning its successor, the T-29. This was a tank built to the same specifications as the T-28, but was smaller and also could remove its tracks and run on wheels. Only the two prototypes were produced, and both did see service with the Red Army, however their fate is unknown. However, by the T-29, multi-turreted tanks had fallen out of favour. For the T-28, it is probably best to remember it at its best role on the parade ground.